الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. We'll uh, pick up from where we left off. We were up to the, the narration of Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه in regards to Humaza and Lumaza al Humaza al Mughtab. Uh, Humaza is the person who does ghiba. Wal Lumaza al Ayyab. And Lumaza is the one who points out the flaws in people over and over again. Thaniha, Qalu Abu Zayd. Abu Zayd says, secondly, Al Humaza bil Yad. Humaza is the one who harms people with his hands. Wal Lumaza bil Lisan. And Lumaza is the one who harms them with their tongue. So, this diverse, diversity of opinions, looking at it from all these different angles, right? Qalu Abu Al Aliya. Al Humaza bil Mawajih. Wal bil Mawajaha. Wal Lumaza bil Zahri al Ghaib. Humaza is done in the face, and Lumaza is done behind the back. Rabi'uha, al-humaza jahran, wal-lumaza sirran bil-hajib. That humaza is done openly, and lumaza is done secretly uh, in when you're turned away from the people. Fifthly, wa khamisuha, al-humaza wal-lumaza al-ladhi yalqabu al-nas bima yakrahuna, wa kan al-walid al-mughira yaf'al thalik, that uh, humaza and lumaza includes those who call people with words or titles or attributions that they don't like and Walid ibn Mughira was known for doing this and he used to do it all the time Hassan says al humaza alladhi yahmaz yahmizu jalisahu yaksiru alayhi aynahu wal lumaza alladhi yathkur akhahu bis su'i wa ya'ibuhu he says humaza is the one who makes fun of and points flaws of the one who he's sitting next to meaning the one who's in his company and he's constantly trying to break his spirit and, and uh, humiliate him with even the way he looks at him, condescending eyes. Yaksiru alayhi aina who implies he looks at him with a condescending fashion, in a condescending fashion. So even facial expressions are being captured inside Homaza. You can look at someone in a uh, condescending tone. This is actually even mentioned more explicitly and in more detail. You know why all these uh, Sahaba and Tabi'un are saying that this is Walid ibn Mughira? Allah Azza wa Jal describes his facial expressions. ثُمَّ النَّظَرْ ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَصَرْ ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ وَاسْتَكْبَرْ That entire attitude is being looked at as humaza. That, that he did, you know, he looked at the messenger. When the Qur'an was being recited, he was asked, go and evaluate it and tell us if this is actually revelation or not. Because you're the best poet among us. So go and listen to it and give us your assessment, your, your expert opinion. Right? So they send him and he's overpowered by the message but he can't show that because showing that would be beneath his ego so he looks at the messenger making like a a real like you know um, arrogant kind of face like really is this it you know so he's staring at him like is this is this all you got that's it and then he starts like okay let me let me think about this so ma'abasa then he like he frowned a little bit you know this bulges on his forehead this is abas hmm Okay, yeah, that's 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 what his apparent revelation is, huh? Wa basar, and he looks away. Thumma adbara, he turns back, turns away. Was takbar, and shows arrogance. Ah, this is just magic. In hada illa sihrun yuthar. That's my expert opinion in the end. But he did this entire facial drama before he passed his opinion, all because people he knows people are watching, and all because this is a means of psychologically attacking someone. You know when someone's speaking to you and you make certain facial expressions and they stop talking and say, what, what, what is it? Why are you looking at me like that? Right? So that you can actually stop someone's train of thought just by the way you're looking at them. You could do that. This is a, you know, a kind of attack you can do to someone when they're speaking. So this is exactly what uh, is being described and this is why Walid ibn Mughira's name keeps coming up, la'anahullah. عن أبي الجوزاء أبي الجوزاء says قال قلت لابن عباس he says that I said to ابن عباس رضي الله عنه ويل لكل همزة لمزة I recited the ayah من هؤلاء الذين يذمهم الله بالويل who are these people that Allah condemns with ويل هم المشاؤون بالنميمة ابن عباس says these are the people who walk around you know uh, informing and tattling and you know uh, uh, ratting out people constantly and constantly, you know, going around and doing so. Al-Mufarriquna bayn al-Ahibbah. These are people that cause division between those who love each other. Al-Na'ituna lil-Nas bil aib Those who are constantly describing people with flaws. The way they call people and talk about people. Oh, you're talking about that short guy over there? Oh yeah, him, yeah. I mean, the, the words they use are constantly describing people in a condescending tone. Oh, you're talking about that really annoying one. Yes, I know him. Right? That's how they talk about people. Na'ituna lil aib you know, constantly describing people with uh, flaws. This is the, again the description of, uh, of Ibn Abbas. وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ جَمِيعَ هَذِهِ الْوُجُوهِ مُتَقَارِبَةِ 
this is uh, Razi's commentary, know that all of these facets, all of these different descriptions that are being offered are very close to one another. Raji'atun ila aslin wahid. They are all, they all come back to one essential concept. Wa huwa ta'an, and that's, you know, uh, uh, condescending sarcasm. Wa idhar al and to expose somebody's flaws. Thumma hadha ala qasamain. And thereafter you should know that this happens in two ways. فَإِنَّهُ إِمَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ بِالْجَدِّ it can happen by an actual effort, meaning somebody is actually spending time and making a proper, you know, exhausting their mental capacity in doing so. كَمَا يَكُونُ عِنْدَ الْحَسَدْ وَالْحَقَدْ The way it happens in uh, jealousy, hasad, the jealousy that is meant to harm someone, and also haqad, which is animosity. وَإِمَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ بِالْحَزَلْ And it can also happen playfully. In other words, a person doesn't actually have evil intent to become hammaz and lammaz, as you will, or humaza or lumaza. But they just do it kind of jokingly, haphazardly, casually. كَمَا يَكُونُ عِنْدَ سُخْرِيَ وَالْإِضْحَاقِ As it happens when you're just making jokes or laughing around. إِمَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ فِي أَمْرٍ يَتَعَلَّقْ بِالدِّينِ He says another way of looking at it is, it can happen in any matter that has to do with the religion. In other words, you're poking fun at somebody's religious behavior, religious appearance, uh, you know, religious knowledge, etc., etc. And one of the side things to note, the scholars comment on this very sensitively. Like, you know, nowadays it's become, that we're living in strange times. The vast majority of Muslims don't act or look very Muslim at all. So those that are trying to hold on to even some remnant of the religion, uh, it maybe in their appearance, in their speech, in their social circles, etc., etc., if they even show some reflection of religion, you automatically become the, the object of ridicule within certain Muslim circles. You are the object of ridicule, not by those who disbelieve, but by those who apparently believe. And when that happens, when somebody, for example, casually says, oh, that guy with the, you know, the extra long beard, and they're making fun of somebody's beard, or somebody's making fun of somebody's hijab or jilbab or something like that. Understand that when you're making some fun of someone's beard, you are making fun of not of the beard, but of something that mimics the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's not a light matter. That person is not growing a beard because you know it's a fashion statement. This is him or her. This this person is trying to mimic the Messenger of Allah. And when when you mimic or ridicule someone who's wearing a hijab then that is not a person, you know, because they come from a certain country or they're trying to show off their religiosity, we, und we assume that they're doing so because Allah commanded as such. We assume that. We assume that they're following the spirit of, you know, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when the ayat came down, she was in the kitchen and she was cooking. And she heard the messenger walking towards the house and through the window she heard the ayat of hijab come down and she tore her apron off and covered her head right away. Right? And it's that spirit that these people are following. So making fun of that is making, it's the same as Ummahatul Mu'mineen. There's no difference between them. You know? So this, we have to be very careful when, when we talk in a condescending way about people that are trying to practice the religion in any capacity, even if you don't agree with them. And I'm not a faqih, nor do I ever, would I ever trample into any area of fiqh. I would not, because I'm certainly not qualified. But I will tell you this. You know, there are differences of opinion on certain issues. Like, for example, different fuqaha have different opinions about, for example, the kufi or the turban and their value in the religion, etc. Et and different scholars have different opinions. I won't even tell you who has what opinion. I'm not qualified. But I will tell you this. If you disagree with somebody's opinion, and you don't think, for example, wearing the turban is that important, but they do. And they wear the turban. Why do you think they wear the turban? Out of love of the messenger, right? Are there narrations that he وسلم, wore a turban? Yes. So when you make fun of that turban, because you, you know, this guy looks like, what I, I won't even use certain words. When you do, oh, so narrow-minded, this and that, and you know, they dress like this, that or the other. Even if you don't agree with it, the fact that they do it out of the love of the messenger والسلام, should be enough for you to respect it. And the Sahaba would do, sometimes they would do the most illogical of things. That you would never assume that they're logical, but we still call them acts of love. You know, like for example, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he would be traveling, and sometimes he would just go like this. He would just lean over on his ride. And the other sahabi would say, why, why do you do that? There's nothing there, he just leans over. He says, there used to be a tree here. And when the messenger used to pass through here, he used to lean over. Right? So he does that out of love of the messenger Right? Now for you and for somebody else, that might be silly. But this is an act of love and we respect it. We, just, we leave it at that. We don't touch it beyond that. We have to be careful about these kinds of things and be sensitive to you know, the, the uh, devotion that people show. Anyhow, 
So it might an yakun fi amrin yata'alak bid deen, it can be in a matter that has to do with the religion. Wahua ma yata'alak bid surah awil mashi. Or it could also have to do with their, you know, their appearance. Meaning you're making fun of somebody's appearance or the way they walk, awil julus, or the way they sit, or the company they sit in. Wa anwa'uhu kathira, and this takes many, many, many forms. Thumma idharu al ghaib fi hadihi al aqsam al arba'a qad yakun li hadir. And thereafter, this exposing of the flaws in these four different categories that he just mentions, it could happen with someone who's in front of you. وَقَدْ يَكُونْ لِغَائِبَ And it can happen for someone who's behind your back. وَعَلَى التَّقْدِيرَيْنَ فَقَدْ يَكُونُ بِاللَّفْضِ And in both of these situations, it can happen with words. وَقَدْ يَكُونُ بِإِشَارَةٍ بِإِشَارَةِ الرَّأْسِ وَالْعَيْنِ it could be even by the gesture of the head, just your facial expression, or your eyes, وَغَيْرِهِمَا And even other than them. وَكُلُّ ذَلِكَ دَاخِلْ تَحْتَ النَّهِي وَالزَّجْرِ This is what I started with back, way back, when we started this verse. And all of this is included in what Allah forbids and what Allah scolds these people on. So be careful of these things. وَلَمَّا كَانَ الرَّسُولُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم أَعْظَمَ الناس من صبن في الدين and it, as it is known already that the messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام is the greatest of the people in far as far as his rank in the religion كان الطعن فيه عظيما عند الله then making sarcasm in regards to him is a magnet is a thing of great magnitude as far as Allah is concerned فلا جرم قال so there is no there is no surprise that he said ويل لكل همزة لمزة there is no surprise that he called for this enormous destruction for the one who uses these words. Because one of the tafsir, one of the uh, uh, opinions in tafsir that is mentioned is that this was talked about specifically with Walid ibn Mughira, like I said, who used to make fun of the Messenger, so, he's, Allah is, so the Mufassir is saying that it, because it's in regards to the Messenger, such heavy language came down because poking fun at him is no light matter. I mean, the guy is already going to hell for being a kafir. Then on top of that, he's digging his grave deeper for poking fun at the Messenger. You're already not in, a, in enough deficit that you need more, you know? I mean, if he didn't say anything against the Messenger, just the fact that he's a kafir is enough for his damnation. Then he's going further into, uh, you know, into his destruction. Now some comments from Ash-Shawkani, rahimahullah. هُوَ مُرْتَفِعٌ عَلَى الْإِبْتِدَاءِ The word وَيْلْ is رَفَعٌ because it's the mubtada of the sentence. وَسَوَّغَ الْإِبْتِدَاءِ مَعَ كَوْنِهِ نَكِرَةً And he made a unique use of the beginning by making it نَكِرَةً What does نَكِرَةً mean? No, oh, نَكِرَةً actually grammatically means without alif lam. Without alif lam. So the norm in a jumla is miya is to begin with alif lam. الْوَيْلُ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةٍ لُمَزَةٍ And he says he made a unique case by not making it ma'rifa, by making it nakira, by not having the alif lam there on wail, instead of al wail, he said wailun. So what benefits does it have? كَوْنُهُ دُعَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ Thus making it a curse against them. Meaning when you say al wail, it's a statement of fact. Destruction falls upon humaza lumaza. But if you take the al off, it becomes a means by which you can make a prayer for or against someone. In other words, this is Allah's way of sending a curse upon them, not just limiting it to a declaration of fact. So th let me explain this to you. You know, you can say to someone in Arabic, Salamun alaykum, which means two things. It means I'm telling you a statement of fact. There is in fact peace upon you. That's one. It's a statement of fact. Two, it's a prayer. May peace be upon you. Two different things. One's a statement of fact. One's a prayer. One's khabariya, one's insha'iya. It's called in grammar, in linguistics, right? So when Allah says, وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةٍ لُمَزَةٍ قَدْ يَكُونُ خَبَرِيَّ قَدْ يَكُونُ insha'iya. It could be that Allah is saying, in fact, destruction is for these people. And Allah is also saying, may destruction fall upon these people. Both of them are included just because Allah took the al off. Now if the al was there, it would only be khabariya. It would only be a statement of fact, but it would not include the, the uslub du'ai. It would not be like a, a prayer or a curse or a call or anything like that. Wal ma'na. Now look at this, this, this meaning according to Shawkani rahimahullah in his tafsir, Fathul Qadir. He says, Wal ma'na khizyun, humiliation, aw adabun, or punishment, aw halakatun, or destruction, aw wadin fi jahannam, li kulli humazatin lumaza, or the valley or a famous valley in hellfire in jahannam for anyone who is humaza. And Lumaza. In other words, there are several narrations of the Prophet ﷺ describing the lowest pit in the hellfire. It is also called Wail. And that valley is so scary that hellfire itself, according to some narrations, asks Allah to protect itself from it. That's Wail. And so by using that word in the general sense, that's one, but also the worst form of destruction, 
the lowest pit, الدرك الأسفل من النار, for these people who are humaza and lumaza, may Allah not make us from them. قال ابن كيسان الهمزة, ابن كيسان says that in regards to humaza, what does he say? الذي يؤذي جلساءه بسوء اللفظ, the one who harms the people sitting around him with the worst kinds of words, واللمزة, اللمزة الذي يكسر عينه على جليسه, the one who passes his eyes over the people he's sitting around, meaning he winks at them, and he, you know, he's poking fun at them, just by you know, communication through the eyes. وَيَشِيرُ بِيَدِهِ or he points at, وَيُشِيرُ بِيَدِهِ or he points at them with his hands, وَبِرَأْسِهِ or with, with facial gestures or with his head, وَبِحَاجِبِهِ meaning when he's not even in their company, وَالْأَوَّلْ أُولَى but the first meaning, meaning the one who makes fun of people with their words, that's the most uh, uh, obvious meaning. وَبِنَاءُ فُعَلَى and the construction of فُعَلَى يَدُلُّ عَلَى الْكَثْرَ We talked about this before, it illustrates uh, uh, not magnitude, but it illustrates uh, many, multifold. Something happens over and over again. فَفِيهِ دَلَالَةٌ عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكَ كَثِيرًا That includes the evidence that he does this often. Now we're going to look at some grammatical notes. These are a courtesy of Dr. Fadl Salih Hassan al-Ra'i. مَا الْفَرْقْ بَيْنَ وَيْلًا وَوَيْلٌ what would the difference be if Allah said wailan? In what form is that now? Nasib. That would be nasib. What would, difference would it make if it was nasib and Allah would have said wailan li kulli humazat lumaza as opposed to the rafa form that, that is there? Al qaida, the principle. Al marfu' yufidul ismiya, that the rafa form illustrates jumla ismiya. Wal mansub juz um min jumla fi'liya. That man, the nasib would mean that this is part of a jumla fi'liya. We talked about the 17 kinds of nasab. I added the 17th, which was if you see a word that's nasab, there's a verb implied before it. That's what he's saying. That if you see that nasab beginning, it means there's a, there's a verb before it. وَإِذَا قُلْنَا وَيْلٌ فَهِيَ جُمْلَ إِسْمِيَا When we say وَيْلٌ, it's جُمْلَ إِسْمِيَا وَيْلٌ لَهُ وَإِذَا قُلْنَا وَيْلًا فَهِيَ جُمْلَ فِعْلِيَا Like Allah says, فَضَرْبَ الرِّقَابِ ضَرْبَ is nasab. When you make it nasab, that statement in Surah Muhammad is jumla fi'liya. وَفِي قَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةِ اللُّمَزَةِ لَمْ يَقُلْ وَيْلًا Okay, now he's explaining what the benefit is. This is the difference, Jumla Ismiya, Jumla Fi'liya. What's the benefit? He's saying by Allah making the Jumla Ismiya, لَمْ يَقُلْ وَيْلًا He didn't say وَيْلًا لِأَنَّ هَذَا هَلَاكٌ دَائِمٌ لَا يَنْقَطِعٌ Because this is destruction that is permanent, that will never cease. Jumla Fi'liya, remember that? Jumla Fi'liya has temporary connotations and Ismiya has permanent connotations. So Allah used the ismiyah because this is permanent and it will never cease. لِذَا قَالَ فِي خَاتِمَةِ surah, And it is the same reason for which he said at the end of the same surah, إِنَّهَا عَلَيْهِمْ مُؤْصَدَةً That it will be completely over, lid, like a lid over them in outstretched columns فِي عَمَدٍ مُمَدَّدَةً وَلَوْ قَالَ وَيْلًا And had he said وَيْلًا in the nasab form ثُمَّ قَالَ فِي الْخَاتِمَةِ And then you look at his words in the, in the end of the surah خَاتِمَةِ نَفْسِ الْآيَةِ فَلَا يَتَنَاسَبُ الْأَمْرُ لُغْوِيًّا Then that would not have correlated with the ending of the surah It wouldn't have been as better, as matched as it is in the ismiya form then, ما دلالة التأنيث في قوله تعالى ويل لكل همزتين لمزتين Why are these words feminine? What's the questioner asking about? What's, what's, what's feminine? That ta marbuta at the end. Why the feminine is being used? هذا ليث مؤنثا This is not feminine. التاء يؤتي بها للمبالغة This ta is only used to hyperbolize, to empower, to magnify a word. وتاء التأنيث هي ليست فقط للتأنيث and the ta used to make feminine isn't only used for feminine. وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةٍ لُمَزَةٍ الْتَاءَ تَدُلُّ عَلَى التَّكْثِيرِ Ta can be used to, to allude to that which is plenty or happens quite a bit. مثلاً فَاعِلَ وَفَعَالَ مِنْ أَوْزَانِ الْمُبَالَغَةِ That the pattern فَاعِلَ and فَعَالَ are from the patterns of hyperbole. رَجُلٌ عَلَّامَ وَفَهَّامَ عَلَّامَ is someone who knows a lot, has a lot, a lot of knowledge. Allama is knowledgeable, Allama is even more knowledgeable. Similarly, he says, Dahiya, another word from the same pattern, meaning from Af'al al Mubalagha. Now we're going to look at the root origin of the words a little bit, inshallah ta'ala. We talked about the tafsir commentary, now we're going a little bit through the root origins. Fu'ala, Lumaza. Allah, this means, Hamaza, first, well, actually, we'll start with Hamaza. Hamaza yahmizu actually means to poke someone with a sharp object. That's what the, the literal word means. Mihmaz in the Arabic language are spikes used on, on the shoes of a horse rider. You know these horse riders, they would have little tiny spikes on the sides of their shoes. So when the horse is getting slow, they kick the horse. 
but they don't kick it with their shoe. It's that little pokey corner that perturbs the horse and makes it go faster. That's called mihmas from the same. Uh, it's also used for a wooden stick that has a metallic tip at the end. A'udhu bika min hamazat al shayateen is another ayah. I seek your refuge from the pokings or disturbings or the annoyances of the shayateen. Humaza, those who are constantly engaged in annoying people and what they say pokes at people, disturbs them, perturbs them. Also illustrates they don't stop until they see the person poked. They keep going until they see that the person can really see them being irked on their face. And until they see it, mission is not accomplished. And they have to keep going, and they have to keep going. This is humaza. <laughs> then lumaza. From lamaza yalmizu, from daraba yadribu, from the same pattern as daraba yadribu, to be on someone's case, to find a flaw, meaning to stay on someone's case constantly, until you find something to criticize. By the way, we're all human beings, so do we all have, all have features that should be criticized? Or deserve to be criticized? Yes. All of us have flaws. So when you're on somebody's case looking for a flaw, will you find it? Absolutely. And then to point them out and to accuse and oppose, uh, accuse, expose and humiliate them. This is lamaza. Uh, lamaza who he gestured at him, at him with the eye or lip or low speech, meaning to speak under one's tongue against someone. Oh, here it comes. That's also lamazahu. That's from the from the linguistic. This is not the see now. This is the linguistic meaning. How it's found in Lisan al Arab and Bahr Muhit and places like that. It's also lamazahu. Also means he spoke evil of him or he found found fault with him. Another similar word offered is yaktabuhum that he backbit against them. What are the differences between humaza? This was a question asked before. What's the difference between humaza and hamaz? In another place, Allah says, Hamazin, Masha'in, Binamim. Okay. Humaza fa asluha humaz. Wahiya min siyagil mubalagha. Humaza, the origin of it is the word humaz alone, and it's from the patterns of uh, hyperbole, mithla hutam, luqa', ghudar, fusaq, etc. Wa yaqulu ahlul lugha. And the people of language, the linguists, they say, Ma buliga bitta yadullu ala nihayati fil wasf wal ghayati fil wasf. This is important. That which has been hyper hyperbolized with an extra ta illustrates the far extreme of an attribute. Not just plenty, but the far extreme of an attribute. And that they are engulfed completely in fulfilling that attribute. Al-Qiyamah, Al-Tamah, Al-Sakhah, Al-Qari'ah. All of them have what at the end? The most extreme form of standing is not Qiyam, it is Qiyamah. Right? So similarly, these, these attributes that are used are used in the, in the strongest cases. فَهَذَا التَّأْنِيثْ لِلْمُبَالَغَةَ بَلِ الْغَايَةَ فِي الْمُبَالَغَةَ Yes, this ta'neeth, this feminizing of the word is for hyperbole, but it's actually to take it to the nth degree in hyperbole. Now, this surah is the final discussion on hellfire. So everything is mentioned in the most final of climactic of forms. So it's only appropriate the most climactic kind of language be used. Even humaza, lumaza, and finally what else? Hutama. And the people who deserve the worst punishment must be doing the worst and the most extreme kinds of humaza and lumaza, hence those forms are justified. وَالْحُطَمَةَ هِيَ بِنَفْسِ سِيغَةِ humaza وَهِيَ صِيغَةْ مُبَالَغَةً لِذَلِكْ نَاسَبَ أَنْ يُذْكَرْ بُلُوغُهُ النِّهَايَةً this is, you know, hutama is in the same pattern and it's only appropriate that the punishment be in the pattern of the pattern of the crime that is committed. As opposed to hamaz. The word hamaz occurs elsewhere, so let's see what the difference is. إِذَنْ نَحْنُ أَمَامْ صِيغَتَيْنِ Then now we are in front of two patterns that are used in the Qur'an. لِلْمُبَالَغَةً Both for hyperbole. إِحْدَاهُمَا تَدُلُّ عَلَى الْمُزَاوَلَةً But one of them uh, alludes to that which is done professionally or done repeatedly in a form that is uh, done with excellence, meaning someone's really good at something, then you use the pattern, you know, fa'al. For example, khabbaz, the one who makes bread really well, a baker, right? Khayyat, the one who could sew really well, right? So, uh, you know, the one who's really good at gift giving is wahhab. Wahhaba to give a gift, but who's really good at gift giving, wahhab, right? Now, Hamaz is used not just for someone who finds flaws or criticizes, but who's professional at it, who's got his own TV show for it. This is Hamaz, who does it over and over again and has this professional excellence to it. Why is this word used? Listen, 
ولا تطع كل حلاف مهين هماز مشاء بنميم من ناع للخير معتد اثيم عتل بعد ذلك زنيم ان كان ذا مال وبنين now one parallel when humaza was mentioned mal was mentioned right humaza was mentioned in surah humaza and mal is mentioned alladhi jama'a malan when hamaz is mentioned also an kana dha malin wa banin this consistency in quran in both the mal is mentioned but the other thing to note here is this surah is talking about the one who was high, who was appointed his job was to constantly criticize and undermine what the messenger is doing constantly call him insane come up with other allegations the surah begins noon noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnun right the, and there were people appointed among the Quraysh who were really good at what they call al-hijab, to criticize, you know, to poke fun at. And they had assigned people to the Messenger وسلم, and Allah tells His Messenger, don't pay any, any attention to them. Don't worry about them. You just keep doing what you're doing. Their professionalism is being highlighted with the word hamaz. That was a place to highlight the nth degree in Surah Humaza, what we're studying. This was to highlight their professionalism and at ta'amul ma'an nas, as, as Dr. Fadl Saleh Hassan Marai comments. Surah Al Qalam predominantly deals with how dealings with people, and when dealings with people over and over again, that pattern is more beneficial. Wa'ilun fiha ma'na dua. We already covered this. Wa'il includes the meaning of prayer or a call made for, actually, in this case, against someone. Wa'ida kana fiha ma'na dua yasuh. And tabda al jumla ismiya biha mithla kawlihi ta'ala salamun alaykum. We actually covered this so I can move on. Okay, my own comments. These are my own notes after I did the grammar study. Some things that I read elsewhere, but I, I wanted to make sure I include. Number one, the tanween on wail leaves something for the imagination. That's my first comment. When you, in jumla ismiya in Arabic, when you have tanween on something, then you need, it requires more explanation. You don't just leave it at that. For example, when you say, for example, وُجُوهُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاظِرَةً Right? وُجُوهُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاظِرَةً That, okay, some faces. But that leads to the imagination, what about the other faces? So the ayah goes on and explains what happens on the other side. بَاسِرَةً تَظُنُّ أَنْ يُفْعَلَ بِهَا فَاقِرَةً etc. etc. It gets mentioned again. The, the, if you start the sentence with a ma'rifa, then there's nothing left open. But if you start the sentence with nakira, something is left open. Right? It's, it's left open. So this wail is left open, it's, gener it's generic. And the other thing is it's not reduced to a singular. This is also a very important concept. You know the difference in the Qur'an between fahisha and al-fahisha? Allah uses fahisha, you know, uh, and He also uses al-fahisha. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً No al, right? وَاللَّاتِ يَأْتِينَ الْفَاحِشَةً مِن نِسَائِكُمْ Fahishatan could be any act of shamelessness, whether done by the eyes, the ears, the hands, the limbs, etc. Al-Fahisha is the final crime of Fahisha, zina itself. There's a difference between them. Now, Wailun is all kinds of destruction, as opposed to Al-Wail would have been a specific destruction. So which is more destructive actually? <laughs> Wail is more destructive because the Al is missing. The word Kul and the fact that the same sentence has been broken up into two ayat, there's, there's two things here. وَيْلٌ لِكُلِّ هُمَزَةٍ لُمَزَ أَلَّذِي جَمَعَ مَا لَمَا One sentence but broken up into two ayat. The word kul illustrates that this is not limited to one or two people or it's only talking about Walid ibn Mughira or it's only talking about you know, one of the Kufa Akhnas ibn Shuraiq or anything like that. Why? Because kul means what? Anyone, everyone who does, each and every one who fulfills these attributes will have to be included in this count. Then there's the word alladhi. Usually when you are describing something that is nakira, that is common, you don't use alladhi because alladhi is proper. Alladhi is proper. So the use of the word alladhi is actually badal. In other words, it's a second group of people. Now we understand that there are two benefits that come from this. One that the next ayah is describing humaza and numaza. Or the next ayah is describing another group of people that also deserve wail. Meaning they, it could be looked at as one group with two attributes, humaza, lumaza, and alladhi jama'a malan, that's one group with two attributes. Or these are two separate groups. And so this is badal, so the way we would read it is wailun lilladhi jama'a malan wa'addada. Badal min wail, or min humaza wa lumaza.
اويل لكل الذي جمع اور شي نوت كل جست بدل من كل ويل للذي جمع مالا وعدد Now here's the bottom line. If you didn't catch it already, here's the bottom line. What are the descriptions of humaza and lumaza that we should know before we move on to the next ayah? These are some words in English I picked to get the point across. Anyone who is condescending, arrogant, insensitive, critical, backbiting, self-indulged, harsh, disrespectful, inconsiderate, vulgar, irreverent, conceited in one's speech, in one's attitudes or in one's body language all of that would be humaza and lumaza i know it's recorded you'll get it eventually okay when there are three uh, okay so and by the way by most accounts as a summary humaza by most accounts is subtle and lumaza by most accounts is explicit so that's basically but even though there's flip flop between the two and there are differences now we come to the next ayah allazi jama amalan the first thing to explore is what's the connection between these two things. What's the connection between this attribute of heart being hurtful to other people and the second one is de dedicated to one concept. Shallow translation, the one who gathered wealth and counted it. That's the shallow translation. So what's the connection between the one who's always critical of people and the one who's gathering wealth? When the one who's always gathering wealth doesn't give any of it, so gets criticized by the people as being greedy. And he doesn't like being criticized. And the best defense is offense. Right? So before he can get he can get to hear from someone, you should be more charitable, you should worry about there are other things to worry about in life than money. Before he gets to hear that criticism, what does he constantly do? Constantly describing others' flaws. Engaged in being humaza or Lumaza, or both rather, even, even worse, being engaged in both. Covering his own flaw of being indulged in his own wealth. Or her own wealth. This is the first thing. Now, الذي بدل من كل أو نصب على الذم. This is uh, Shaukani's commentary. Either this is a replacement of كل, which I mentioned, or الذي is نصب على الذم. Do you remember this lesson? Yeah. Right. Now the Mufassir is saying it. He's saying this الذي could be نصب as a means of Allah condemning him. In other words, you don't recite الذي جمع مالا وعدده. الذي جمع مالا وعدده. It's Allah is condemning this person. It's not a time to recite it nicely. This, Allah is not being nice to him. Nasb ala dham. Right? He's being condemned. He's being scolded by Allah. And this zajr from Allah Azza wa is supposed to in and of itself be terrorizing. Wa quri'a jamma'a bit tashdeed. This ayah in another qira'ah is also recited with, the, with a shad on jama'a. Instead of jama'a, it is jamma'a. Wa huwa mutabiqun li'addada. And that way it becomes consistent with عَدَّدَ So الَّذِي جَمَّعَ مَالًا وَعَدَّدَ So the, the two patterns become consistent with each other. وَقِيلَ عَدَّدَهُ جَعَلَهُ عِدَّةً لِحَوَادِثِ الدَّهْرِ And they say another meaning of عَدَّدَ which is usually uh, translated as counted is to prepare. عِدَّة is also to prepare like وَأَعِدُّ مَسَطَعْتُ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ Right? Prepare, make, take, make means. In other words, he's counting money and he's constantly making preparations for what might happen in the future. Future insurance, if you will. This is my fund for this, this is my fund for that. Isn't that what savings are all about? So this is addada. Not just counting, but making plans of where this money will be used for what future catastrophe or backup or safety net. is. I think the safety net is the word they use in finance nowadays. So... Now, فرق أن جمع بالتشديد يفيد أنه جمعه من ها هنا وها هنا. If you recite جمع, well, how does the meaning change? The meaning becomes it illustrates that he gathers wealth from here and there. Doesn't care where it comes from. He's, he's constantly looking for ways to make money and gather more and more and more of it. وأنه لم يجمعه في يوم واحد. And it's not like he gathered all this money in a single day, ولا في يومين or two days, ولا في شهر ولا في شهر. In order in a month or two months. In other words, he spent his entire life gathering money. And why is this, where did this meaning come from? Jama'a is used in the past tense. Past tense means you're looking back at what already happened. So it's, it is as though Allah is looking back at his entire life, and his entire life amounts to one activity. Gathering wealth his, wealth his entire life. The other thing here is, remember I said, when a person doesn't have a higher goal in life, they get lost in trivial pursuits? Well, one trivial pursuit was the first ayah, finding flaws in people. What's the other trivial pursuit? Gathering wealth and constantly, constantly making plans for the future. And these people, they become so narrow-minded, when you start worrying about your deen and less about saving your money, you know what they say to you? Think about your future. Right? And the, the ironic thing is, you are thinking about your future. <laughs> 
They're the ones who are not thinking about your future. And they're saying, think long term. And guess what? The irony is, they're the ones thinking short term. You know, what are you going to do in the next 10 years? Dude, what are we going to do for the next thousand years in our grave? What's going to happen after we get out? That's long term thinking. <laughs> this isn't long term thinking. But their minds get wrapped around this, this idea and this becomes their whole world view. So, uh, then he says, فَلَا يَجْمَعْ الْأَمْوَالِ الَّذِي يَجْمَعْهَا مِنْ هَاهُنَا وَهَاهُنَا That this person gathered, Fulan rather, he gathered it from whatever source he could. وَأَمَّا جَمْعْ بِالتَّخْفِيفِ فَلَا يُفِيدُ ذَلِكْ But if you leave it as jama'a, then that meaning doesn't come out. فَمَالُ الْإِنسَانُ الْوَاحِدْ بِالنِّسْبَةِ إِلَى مَالِ كُلِّ الدُّنْيَا حَقِيرٍ he says, Allah didn't say mal, he said amwal. He didn't say amwal, which means assets. He used mal in the singular, which is a means of tahqeer, meaning belittling the wealth. So he's saying, how much are you going to gather anyway? Your wealth compared to the wealth that is out there in the world is nothing. So what is it that you're so proud of? It's haqeer. فَكَيْفَ يَلِيقُ بِهِ أَنْ يَفْتَخِرُ بِذَلِكَ الْقَلِيلِ How can it be for anyone of intellect that be, they be proud of something so minuscule? The other, the other way, look, some ulama looked at it, they said, فَمَا, حيا, فما, الحياة, no, فَمَا مَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا قَلِيلِ فِي سُرُوتِ التَّوْبَةِ The entire utility of worldly life when compared to the next is nothing but a little. This is what you're proud of? This is really what you have to, you know, that you're so uh, full of yourself about. Compare this to his sa the same person's attitude on the Day of Judgment. Allah says, on the Day of Judgment, nothing will benefit him. Even if he offers the weight of the entire planet Earth in gold, and tried to exchange that for his own salvation, gave that away, it wouldn't, it wouldn't benefit him. So what is he so proud of? It doesn't make any sense. And yakun al-murad, it can also mean that the meaning here is minhu ta'zim ay malun malan balaga fil khabth wal fasad aqsan nihayat. Also means that alladhi this this dham uh, uh, of it illustrates that he went by and and tried to gather wealth, whether those means be filthy or corrupt. He went to the farthest extends to get his money. And by the way, if you look, I'm not an economist, but I did study. I went to business school. One of the things we said is international business and multi-million dollar corporations and their behaviors and things like that. It's crazy the kinds of oppression that people do in the name of a buck. The kinds of oppression people do in the name of a dollar. Right? They, you know, these, these kinds of labor factories and things like that. We read of stories where like there's these child labor factories and they produce products that end up in malls in the United States, right? And they produce these things and child labor is being used to produce them. And if people try to get those kids out of there, they actually have money in their budgets to hire local militias to guard the factory so the kids don't escape. And that's part of their market, like their planning strategy. And until the UN or somebody intervenes, it's going to stay business as usual. And of course, you know, you pay the local politicians, whatever, so the news never gets out, the media never makes its way in, no documentary ever gets made, etc., etc. So they will go to the most extreme means, all in the name, in the end, of a few dollars. I mean, look at the oppression that has been caused in this country in the name of greed. Not even against people across the Atlantic. How many people have lost their homes in the name of greed? I mean, this entire, the, the entire collapse of the economy, the product of it, now they're having entire NPR shows dedicated to it, that you know, the business school at Harvard and you know, at, at, at NYU were teaching unethical business practices, money at all costs. The bottom line is the final principle. The final principle isn't serving humanity or creating a stable economy or thinking 10 years ahead. Just worry about yourself. Now think about, just, just think about this, one more, just uh, a side comment about this. You know the, the, um, the Donald Trump mentality. Donald Trump is a very, very powerful, multi-billion dollar executive, right? And he's, you know, I don't even, I think he's got a TV show too where he's making people into entrepreneurs and things like that. Bottom line is he's a real estate tycoon more than anything else, right? And you know how real estate in this society works. You buy, and you, you buy, but you don't pay for it. You use your credit to buy, and you don't make the maximum payments. You make what? The minimum payments. And now your credit is being built. When your credit is built, you buy again. You rent it out or whatever. And you keep building your empire. Now, if, if Donald, the Donald Trump-like billionaire was to pay off every one of his properties today, would he still be a billionaire? No. What's his idea? His idea is, how long am I going to live? Another 50 years? 60 years? 100 years? How long am I going to live? I'm going to live a billionaire, and after that, if my payments aren't being made, who cares? I already partied my way out. 
So this entire deficit will, go, will be passed down to the next generation. I couldn't care less. So the, dollar, the value of the dollar goes down, people's dollar at the grocery store doesn't go that far, and it can be blamed on him, but what does he care? He already did his partying and he's gone. In other words, don't think about anyone but who? Yourself. malan wa addada. This is the, the, at the heart of capitalist thinking. At the heart, at the core of it. Now compare this to the mind of the Muslim. Uh, just one more smaller example, because this is dealing with economics, right? A home. You know, home ownership in this country is a big deal. And of course it bubbled and collapsed and all of that. But just put it in very simple economic terms, even like a, an elementary school child can understand. A hundred years ago, somebody buys a house. You know, somewhere in New York City, somebody, somebody buys a house. Let's say they pay 50000 for it. But they don't buy it cash, and they don't buy it interest-free, they buy it on a mortgage. So they end up paying over 30 years, not 50000 what do they end up paying? 150000 Okay, now it's time for them to sell it. Are they going to sell it for 60000 No, they ended up putting in 150, so they should at least sell for 200 and 250. So they sell it for 250. The next buyer comes in, buys the place for 250, but he didn't buy it cash. What did he buy it on? Credit. So he's not going to pay 250. Over 30 years, he'll pay 400, 500,000. When time comes for him to sell it, it keeps going up, right? So what's happened is, first of all, the value of the currency went down. Second of all, those who could own a home 100 years ago, with that kind of money, can they still own a home generations later? No. So you made the opportunity for the next generation more and more and more impossible. This is what riba does. This is what jama amalan wa addadah does. It creates problems for the future. Now compare this to the Muslim mind. The Muslim mind is, you know, you have an old man who's already got a foot in the grave and he's planting a seed in the ground for a tree to grow. And you ask him, you're not going to be, you're not going to live long enough for this tree to grow. And he says, well, it will give somebody shade one day, sadaqa jariya for me. This is the mind of the Muslim, right? It's, that's what it's supposed to be. We think about how the future will be benefited. Not, you know, live, eat, sleep, drink, and die. That's it, you know. This is, the, this is the, the reversal of thought. And that's really, when we read this stuff, we shouldn't just think about what's happening, you know, a millennium and a half ago. This is, these are realities of our time. These are, these are serious problems of our time. And unfortunately, just because we're Muslim, doesn't mean that we haven't been engrossed in the deepest depths of the black greed of capitalism. We ourselves have become really nasty capitalists ourselves. And we don't think about the greater good and serving society and building the kinds of institutions, right? We've become people of Allah, may Allah protect us from it and get us out of this mess. Okay. أَعْدَدْتُ شَيْءٍ لِكَذَا وَعَدَّدْتُهُ إِذَا أَمْسَكْتُهُ لَهُ وَجَعَلْتُهُ عِدَّةً وَذَقِيرًا لِحَوَادِثِ الدَّهْرِ وَثَانِيهَا عَدَّدَهُ What he's saying in the entire line basically is that, you know, عَدَّدَ means to prepare something, to get something ready, also means to prepare for future uh, catastrophes. أَيْ أَحْصَاهُ also means to count properly. وَجَاءَ التَّشْدِيد And it came with شَدَّة وَعَدَّدَ It came with Shadda. What's the benefit of the shadda? Yadullu li kathratil ma'adud illustrates that there's a lot to count. He's always busy counting and there's a lot to count. He's constantly counting. Also illustrates he does it over and over again. You see people that are, can't help themselves every couple of hours, the oxygen gets thin in the lungs and they have to log into the account and see the balance again. Right? I, I went to business school. There were majors with me that were finance majors. Guys that were finance majors, even Muslims, right? And we're in the library studying, for example, what are they doing? They just learn how to invest stock. So what are they doing constantly? Oh, it went up. Oh, it went down. Oh, it, like somebody jolts them with electricity. You know, they're on their E-Trade account. Oh, oh, يَتَخَبَّطُهُ الشَّيْطَانِ مِنَ الْمَسِ Allah says, it's like shaitan has touched him a little. And has poked him. And he's just constantly jittering. Oh my God, oh my God, oh, oh yes, it came back. And they're constantly having these emotional reactions in the library. And the library has to come and say, shh. And he says, no, 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 I'm engaged in, you know, jam'u malin wa hadid, you know. <laughs> I'm, you know. <laughs> so, ajma'u malin wa uaddidu, right? So the first ayah is dedicated towards his attitude against others. And the second is his occupation for himself. What is he occupied with himself? Interestingly, know that what is expected of the human being is the exact opposite. You are supposed to be the best to others. And you're supposed to not keep wealth for yourself, but be giving. What is expected of you is the exact opposite of the behavior being described. So, عدد, to count and place, to count over and over again, to keep track of the count. And it can, be also be, it can also be, like I said, associated with 
Preparation, preparing for future needs. How much time do we have left? I don't even have a clock here anymore. Oh, I have time. I'm going to take my time. Okay. <laughs> why together? Uh, we talked about why these ayat come together, what the association between these two is essentially, one, the attitude towards others, and what's going on inside of himself. Now, the, the, we talked about the use of the word malin in the singular, uh, and what, uh, that it amounts, uh, talks about his life as a whole. Now we're ready for the third ayah. يَحْسَبُ أَنَّ مَا لَهُ أَخْلَدَهُ Yahsab is called مِنْ أَفْعَالِ الْقُلُوبِ Verbs that are used for the heart. In other words, now Allah is doing a psychological analysis of what's going on inside him. The first two ayat were about his actions. Th those are outward. But now the third is Allah probing inside him. What's going on inside him? يَحْسَبُ He assumes. Uh, that his life will, that his wealth will give him eternal life or will grant him immortality. Now the thing here is malahu, but in the previous ayah we didn't read alladhi jama'a malahu. We read alladhi jama'a malan because he's gathering wealth that is his and also that isn't rightfully his, but he's acquiring it anyway. So malan includes in it his criminal behavior. But now that he's acquired it, it became his, whatever he has stored inside, he thinks it's going to give him everlasting life. Now this answers one of the deepest questions. Why do people run after money? That's a deep question to ask. When you ask, you know, why do you want money to a child? They say, I don't know. I might want something later, <laughs> right? But ask yourself the difficult question, why does humanity run after wealth? If the food is on the plate today, you stop worrying about today, you stop worrying about tomorrow. In other words, akhlada doesn't just mean eternal life, it means that which will continue to sustain him endlessly. In other words, he's worried that if he doesn't have savings, he, will, he or she will cease to exist. You know people become suicidal when, there's, when their stock account you know, they drops, right? Their investment accounts went to zero and they became suicidal because they associated surviving with savings. Not with food they have right now, but the food they were saving for tomorrow. This is part of the meaning of akhlada. He doesn't just think he'll live forever, but he thinks that his future needs, this is from ikhlad, from khulud, his future needs are taken care of because he or she has savings, because they have these savings. So, this, uh, and, and by the way, this, this is tied to the idea of building monuments. You know, people, they want to be known for things. And one of the things people get known for is wealth. And you know, at, at the end of people's lives, if they don't believe in an afterlife, they don't give it in sadaqah, they give in their own form of sadaqah. They'll donate to a charity or to a hospital, to a university, so a monument will be named after them. Right? So this is the only thing of them that will live on. So they're making their wealth a means by them to which, by, by means of which they can live on through these empty monuments, this rock and metal or whatever is used to make those monuments. This concept is also dis, uh, talked about in the Quran. When the nation of Hud is mentioned, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَتَتَّخِذُونَ مَصَانِعَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَخْلُدُونَ تخلدون. You make statues so you can live forever? What does that have to do with living forever? No, their name, their legacy, their memory will live forever. Is this your reason for building these unnecessary monuments? And they'll build these huge monuments with monies that could have fed thousands of people. But no, we have to build these monuments. We have to build these, you know, erect these you know, great uh, 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 models of architecture. And this is happening, by the way, in the Muslim world. You'll see pictures of the Muslim world with these beautiful monuments in a poor country. But they need to build this monument, this is a symbol of national solidarity. How about the homeless people hanging in front of the monument? Are they not a symbol of your national solidarity? How about give some of them th that money? What are they going to do? They're going to lick that tower now? What are they going to do with it? You know? So the, the m monies are spent in these, way, in these wasteful ways, and these are means by which people feel them, their nation, even themselves, will get to live on forever. Uh, this actually, uh, I read this quote last time, I'll read it to you again. It, this is in describing a philosopher's attitude towards the pyramids. And, he's, and, and the philosopher, when he writes this, it was written at, right under the picture of the pyramids in a, in, a, in a museum. And just listen to his words. Calm and self-possessed, still and resolute, the pyramids echo unto eternity the defiant cry of man's will to survive and conquer the storms of time. Man will die, at least the pyramid I build will conquer the storms of time. His quest, his desire for eternity, for living eternally. Allah put that desire inside the human being. If that desire is not channeled towards seeking Jannah, it will be channeled towards getting your wealth and building monuments. And that's what will channel. But the desire is there. 
Like Allah put the desire inside us to appreciate beautiful things. And if you don't appreciate the beautiful recitation of Qur'an, you will become obsessed with music. The desire is there, but it's just got, it's gonna get channeled. It's gonna go in one direction or the other, you understand? So that's what we're learning here. So the people who don't, and by the way, this is the comment of one of my teachers, Dr. Sarah Ahmed, he said about this, uh, this surah, he said that there are two, tempt two temptations of dunya. It's money and children usually that are talked about in the Qur'an. Right? at takathur fil amwali wal awlad. Obviously this surah is, a, is talking which one? Mal. Mal, not awlad. And he made a comment about that, just his own observation. He said, in my own life I have noticed the people who don't have children, they become even more obsessed with wealth. If they don't have kids, then you, if you have kids, you have two concerns. But if you have, don't have kids, you become overly concerned with wealth and counting money. And if you tell people who don't have kids who become overindulged in wealth, why don't you have kids? What's the number one reason they give you? <laughs> wealth. I don't know if you can afford it. I don't know if, you know, we have enough for ourselves. We don't know if we have enough for a child. It might cramp our style or our, you know, our, our future plans, etc. So now in tafsir of this, yahsabu anna malahu akhlada. The wealth will increase his false hopes. And it will give him wishful thoughts or fortify his wishful thoughts that are far away. Until it becomes a means by which he gets deeper and deeper into his heedlessness and extends his false hopes. He assumes his wealth will leave him remaining in this world as though he won't die. It also implies in the next life that he thinks, this is a very important mentality by the way, there are people today that believe because Allah gave them so much here that they will be doing pretty well over there. Hey, Allah loves me so much here, He's obviously taking care of me here, so I can only expect better when I go. <laughs> but this is actually a real mentality. It's at the heart, by the way, of many a, pro a, a Protestant factions of Christianity. They actually, they will tell you in the sermon, God wants you to go get that promotion. He wants you to make that extra money. He wants you to get that second mortgage. Because He loves you. Right? Make more and that will be a sign that Allah loves you more. This is actually mentioned in the Quran in the story of the two gardeners in Surah Al-Kahf. The guy thinks he's got a better garden, so he figures, وَمَا أَظُنُّ سَاعَةَ قَائِمَةً I don't think the hour is ever going to establish against me. Even if it was returned to my master, I would find better return over there than here. Allah has only given me dunya stuff here, He'll give me akhira stuff there. You're poor here, you'll probably be poor over there too. That was his mentality. And by the way, this mentality, believe it or not, has seeped into the minds of many Muslims. They will think Allah is taking, Allah loves me so much, he, we, we have a beautiful home, we have a great job, business is great. Clearly Allah loves us, He sees something in us, He didn't see in other people. So why should we worry? Allah is really taking care of us. Well, know that these things that we thank Allah for, more than anything else, they are a test. For some people their poverty is a test, for other people their wealth is a test. But they're both a test. None of them are, it doesn't put you in a superior position to the other. So I'm not saying richer people are in a worse position, and poorer people are in a better position. But understand both are being tested. Both of them are being tested. May Allah help us understand our test and live, uh, live a life that successfully passes that test. وَعَلَمْ أَنَّ أَخْلَدَهُ وَخَلَدَهُ بِمَعْنَى وَاحِدْ Shawkani says, know that أَخْلَدَ and خَلَدَ the verbs have the same meaning. ثُمَّ فِي التَّفْسِيرِ وُجُوهُ أَحَدُهَا But in tafsir they, have, they take two faces. يَحْتَمِلَ أَنْ يَكُونَ الْمَعْنَى طُولَ الْمَالِ أَطَوَّلَ الْمَالِ أَمْ لَهُ One of the meanings can be that the wealth will extend his hopes and his means and that's why he starts thinking he'll live forever. وَلَمْ يَقُلْ يُخْلِدْهُ يُخْلِدُهُ And he didn't say it will give him eternal life. He didn't use the present future tense, he used the past tense. لِأَنَّ الْمُرَادِ يَحْسَبُ هَذَا الْإِنسَانِ Because the meaning is that this human being assumes أَنَّ الْمَالَ ضِمْنٌ لَهُ الْخُلُودِ وَأَعْطَاهُ الْأَمَانِ مِنَ الْمَوْتِ وَكَأَنَّهُ حَكَمَ وَقَدْ فَرَغَ مِنْهُ وَلِذَلِكَ ذَكَرَهُ عَلَى الْمَاضِي What he's essentially saying is, it is because the human being assumes that now that he has wealth already, this matter is dealt with, I'm already taken care of, I don't have to worry about the future anymore, because I already have wealth. In other words, the warnings of the akhirah, the warning of the future, it doesn't bother him. The first thought that crosses his mind is, I'm okay, I'm doing alright, I'm taken care of. Other people may have to worry, I'll be alright. And others even think, and this is commented on by Mufti Muhammad Shafi'i in the tafsir of the surah. 
in one of his recorded durus, he said that there are people who think they can buy their way into paradise. Right? So when they're warned, they say, I have wealth, I, if I can't, if, you know, if I'm not obeying Allah, that's fine, I can pay my way through. I, you know, just like paying a little extra to get the elite package for Hajj, I'll get the elite package pass, you know, go right through, pass by security gates and go straight to paradise, it'll be, you know, it'll be waiting for me. So this idea of me having furuh, me being completely uh, uh, unconcerned about what is to come. قال الحسن حسن says ما رأيت يقينا this is an amazing statement by the way ما رأيت يقينا لا شك فيه أشبه بشك لا يقين فيه كالموت I didn't see something so certain in which there is absolutely no doubt and people are so in doubt about it as though there is no certainty in it as a, like death death is something that is so sure there is no doubt about it and people's attitude towards it is it is so uncertain as though there is not going to happen ever they are completely in doubt about it subhanallah أحب المال حبا شديدا This is the, one of the implications of the ayah That he loved wealth with an intense form of love حتى اعتقد أنه إن انتقص مالي أموت Until he started believing if my wealth goes down I will die فلذلك يحفظه من النقصان ليبقى حيا So he protects it from, being, from going down so he can remain alive وهذا غير بعيد من اعتقاد البخيل And this is not very far from the way of thought and the conviction and the creed of the one who is miserly or the poor, the, the, the greedy one. And هذا تعريض بالعمل الصالح and this is a contradiction to righteous action. وأنه هو الذي يخلد صاحبه في الدنيا بالذكر and this is the uh, the, the righteous one knows that uh, the, that the person who is the one of good deeds it will that is what will give him eternal life by mentioning the good things and in the end it will he will have blissful life now my own thoughts on what we've studied so far before we conclude this surah inshallah don't worry we're getting somewhere what time is it by the way oh man okay i gotta try i'll try to finish if i don't finish i won't we'll see okay the symmetry of the surah it's amazing Allah Azza wa Jal mentions five criminal acts. Humaza, Lumaza, Jama'a Malan, right? Wa Addada, and Yahsabu, Al Husub, and Al Mal Akhladahu, right? Al Husban, and Al Mal Akhladahu. Yahsabu, and Malahu Akhladahu. Five criminal acts. And when you study the end of the surah, Allah describes five descriptions of punishment. Hutama, Narullah al Muqada, التي تطلع على الأفئدة number three إنها عليهم مقصدة number four في عمد مبدلة number five incredibly balanced surah and an incredible way to strike fear into the heart of the one who is immersed in this kind of attitude كلا لا ينبذن في الحطمة حطم also means to break the original meaning of حطم is كسر that which is broken Hutama is used for crop that goes yellow and becomes crushed eventually and people step on it, as soon as they touch it, what happens to it? It breaks, it falls apart. This word is used in, in contrast with another word that in the surah was used to break someone's spirit, remember? Al-Humaz, Kasar, right? You break other people's spirit and dignity, you will end up some, in a place that will break you, that will crush you, Hutama, subhanallah, how the words come together. You know the ants when they were scared of Sulaiman, they said la 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 uh, la that may Sulaiman not end up trampling over you, crushing you, breaking you to pieces. Some say that hutam hutama is the fourth or sixth layer of hell. Allah Taala alam. These are only opinions. I didn't find any hadith text or any athar of a sahabi corroborating it. The fire is attributed to Allah Azza wa Jalla. We'll talk about that in a, uh, a bit. Let's just finish this discussion of the ayah. Kalla la yumbadhanna. Nabada in Arabic is to throw something that has no value to you whatsoever. Nabada, to throw something that has no value to you whatsoever. Allah says, no, not at all. You know, He says life, His wealth will give Him life. Allah refutes. He says, no, not at all. Rather, for sure, there is no doubt about it whatsoever. I'm using all these words for emphasis because there's la, la, and then there's two noons at the end. And then Allah says, la yumbadanna. He will definitely be thrown. And this is to throw something that has no value to you. This was the word used to describe Bani Israel when they threw Torah behind their back. They threw it behind their back because it had no value to them. This, is the, this person thinks he has all the value in the world because of what? 
as well. And by the way, one of the things I didn't mention, you know why he talks to people that way? Because he's got money. He thinks he can get away with Who's going to talk back to me? I could talk to my employee like that. I'm the major donor at the Islamic Center. Who's going to talk back to me? Without my contributions, the school won't survive. I can talk however I want. This donation is also, it's not only a blank check, it's a blank check for my tongue. Right? This is what he assumes. So now, at the end, he is valueless. He is thrown like trash. Fil hutama, in al hutama, in in this uh, most despicable place. Al thani ma'nahu la yum bathunna fil fil lam jawab al qasam. Allah, the linguists say that lam la yum bathun la yum bathunna is the response to an oath. In other words, Allah is saying, I swear He will be thrown. Not only definitely, definitely, definitely he'll be thrown, Allah swears on top of that because of the lam. The other thing is, layum badanna can be, uh, it's some qiraat actually recited as following. Layum badanna. Now, what did you hear different? Layum badanna. Layum badanna. It made it longer, right? That alif made it appear. Two. Meaning, huwa wa maluhu. Him and his money will be thrown. You loved it so much, go. Live with it. You never wanted to let go of it, right? Okay, you won't let go of it ever. You can go get crushed with it together. <laughs> Subhanallah. Huwa wa maluhu. So, and by the way, fil hutama, by using the word fi, yaqtadi annahu mawdi'un lahu qa'a, amiqun jiddan kal bi'r. By using the word fi, he will be thrown in it. It implies that this is a place that is very, very deep. That he will be thrown way down in, in, a, in a deep ditch. لَيُمْ بَذَنَّ بِضَمِّ الذَّانِ It's also been recited لَيُمْ بَذُنَّ So there are three recitations لَيُمْ بَذَنَّ لَيُمْ بَذَنَّ And then لَيُمْ بَذُنَّ هُوَ وَأَنصَارُهُ Him and the people who helped him become this way So the three interpretations I, He himself, him and his wealth And then him and his entire posse His entire social circle وَسُمِّيَتْ النَّارْ هَا هُنَا بِالْحُطَمَ And the fire was called حُطَمَ here لِأَنَّهَا تَحْتِمَ العظام. Because it crushes the bones Hatta tasila ila al Until it reaches the hearts It's called hutama Because it crushes bones And reaches to the hearts How do we know it reaches the hearts? Innaha tattali'u ala al-af'idah that, That's coming Nabada we, we talked about the meaning of nabada Another word in Arabic that's similar is Taraha Ta, ra, and ha Which also to throw something But it's, using, it's used to throw something Hiding it away from people like you know you want to throw something away in the trash but you don't want to put it outside for the neighbors to see and you hide it. By the way, this is used when the brothers of Yusuf were trying to get rid of him. Awitrahuhu. Hide him so people don't see him. Throw him away in a place where people don't see him. Right? So that's a different kind of meaning of the word. فَإِنَّمَا ذَكَرَهُ بِلَفْضِ النَّبَذْ أَدَّالَ عَلَى الْإِهَانَةِ He used the word نَبَذْ with them, illustrating humiliation against them. لِأَنَّ الْكَافِرْ كَانَ يَعْتَقِدُ أَنَّهُ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكَرَامَةِ because the disbeliever used to believe that he is from the people that deserve dignity. Qala maqatil, hiya tahtamul idam, wa ta'kulul luhum. That maqatil says it will crush bones and eat the flesh, hatta tahjim ala kulub until it makes its way, away, way on top of the hearts. The benefits of uh, mentioning Jahannam by this name. Number one. What are the benefits? This is Imam Fakhruddin al Razi. He makes a list of the benefits why Allah would use the word hutama instead of jahannam in this surah. Number one, al ittihad fi surah. Ka'annahu ta'ala yaqul. It unifies the surah as though Allah is saying, In kunta humazatan lumaza, fawara'ak al hutama. If you have been humaza lumaza, right behind you I have sent hutama. So it's unifying the surah. The second, anna al hamiz bi kasri aynin. Hamiz is the one who winks at people, breaks their spirit by looking at them in a condescending way. لِيَضَعَ قَدْرَهُ So he can throw, do away with his dignity. فَيَقُولُ تَعَالَى So Allah is saying, وَوَرَاءَكَ الْحُطَمَةِ فِي الْحَطْمِ, في, في الحطم كَسَرْ And right behind you, I have sent hutama because hutam includes also breaking. So it ties the two subjects together. أَنَّ الْحَمَّازَ الْلَمَّازِ يَأْكُلُ لَحْمَ النَّاسِ Listen to this. Because the, the, the hamaz and the lamaz, these humaza and lumaza, they are eating the flesh of the people. That's what they do. Riba and condes- this kind of talk is eating the flesh of the people. وَالْحُطَمَ أَيْضًا إِسْمٌ لِلنَّارْ مِنْ حَيْثُ إِنَّهَا تَأْكُلُ الْجِلْدُ وَاللَّحْمُ Because hutama is called that, it, the word is used because it will also eat the flesh. And, the, and is, as a result of you eating the flesh of the people, it will eat your flesh and your skin. This is the one that's my favorite. This one, 
SubhanAllah, I appreciate the genius of Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi. By the way, he has certain opinions in Aqidah that most scholars don't take. And that doesn't discredit his work. The man is an absolute genius when it comes to linguistic analysis. And we take the good and that which we disagree with, we make dua to Allah that he overlook those mistakes, which scholar is beyond mistakes. You know, after the Messenger of Allah if you're going to say that one made that mistake and that one made that mistake, look at what you did last weekend before you talk about somebody else. Right? These scholars gave their lives studying deen. So if they, they said something that the majority didn't accept, we overlook that and we ask Allah to overlook it in light of all the good that they did. And now look, this, this comment that just blew me away. It is as though Allah is saying, take one from me in response to two crimes from you. What's he saying? Take hutama from me because of humaza and lumaza that you are. Right? Take one from me for two of you have done. Then someone might say, how can one be suffice for, one punishment be suffice for two crimes? We were expecting two, but one is mentioned in place of two. فَقَالْ إِنَّمَا تَقُولْ It is as though Allah says, هَذَا لِأَنَّكَ لَا تَعْرِفُ هَذَا الْوَاحِدِ This is because you don't know what this one is, and that's why Allah says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْحُطَمَ What would give you any idea what this hutama is? He poses it as a question. You might say, how can one be equated with two? You have no idea what you're talking about. Hence, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْحُطَمَ Beautiful. Hatama to break, to bend, to twist out of shape. Hatum is a wind that breaks things and bends things out of shape in its path. It is used for that also which is crushed and crumpled like we said. Now, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْحُطَمَ Have you realized, مَا أَدْرَاكَ This is the English literary equivalent. What would give you the slightest clue? Also signifying you will never know what hutama is. The next ayah has a clue as to why you will never know what hutama is. Allah says, Narullah, the fire of Allah. Now let me explain in very explicit terms why this is important before we get to the word al muqada You remember Naqatullah, the she camel of Allah. By using the word Allah next to Naqa, Allah is letting us know this camel cannot be compared to any other camel. The camel of so-and-so can be compared to camel of so-and-so. But the camel of Allah cannot be compared to any other camel. Now the fire I made versus the fire made by someone who has far more fuel, far more people working to build a large fire, there's a comparison. They have more resources, they have a bigger well, they have a lot of oil, they made a huge bonfire, it can be compared. But the fire of Allah, by using that phrase, this is a fire that can never ever be compared to any fire. The only thing that can be said is, this is the fire especially designed by Allah. So by using the word Allah, He made it incomparable, which makes the last statement even more appropriate. What can possibly give you a clue? Because this is the fire of Allah, nothing is able to give you even the slightest idea of what kind of fire this is. Narullah. Then He says, al muqada muqada is an ism maf'ul, as opposed to an ism fa'il muqida. Ism fa'il, muqada, ism maf'ul, right? So it comes from awqada yuqidu iqad, and this, first of all, muqada means that which is lit. That which is lit. Mentioning right next to Allah implies Allah Himself lit it. That's what it, because it's mentioned, right? So the, uh, the fire of Allah that has been lit, implying that has been lit by Allah Azza wa Jal. That's number one. Number two, here Allah is highlighting subhanahu wa ta'ala the act itself, meaning the lighting itself, instead of Himself. He's been highlighted in the word Allah. But then the fire has been highlighted in the ism. Maf'ul. He didn't say, Narullah al muqid Because muqid would have referred to Allah. The fire of Allah who lit it. But no, the fire of Allah that has been lit, then you just imagine how badly it's been lit. So it's, been, it's focusing your attention on the fire again. Then Ibn al-Faris says, this word muqada iqad, kalimatun tadullu ala ishti'al nar it is used, it illustrates the sparks of a fire. A loud flame that has a lot of sparks coming out of it. أَمَّا قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى نَارُ اللَّهِ فَالْإِضَافَ لِلْتَفْخِيمِ أَيْهِيَا نَارٌ لَا كَسَائِرِ النِّيرَانِ This, this uh, association of nar with Allah is for magnifying it, so you know that this is a fire, لَا كَسَائِرِ النِّيرَانِ that cannot be like any fire, any other fires that exist. الْمُوْقَدَ الَّتِي لَا تَخْمِدُ أَبَدًا a muqada implies a fire that will never ever go down. I will muqada bi amrihi aw bi qudratihi. This is awesome. Muqada implies two things. One, it's lit by Allah's command. Allah commanded it and it got lit. Aw bi qudratihi, meaning Allah created it in a way that it remains that way. Which is why an ism is used as opposed to a fi'l. Narullahi 
التي أوقدت right التي توقد a verb would have been used but الموقدة implies it remains lit it stays that way it doesn't go down you know if, if you know anything about lighting a fire what happens eventually it dies out but by using موقدة Allah made it an endless fire subhanallah التي تطلع على الأفئدة the one that rises up against or makes its way climbs painstakingly Tala'a in Arabic is used for the rising of the sun, which is a smooth rising. But ittala'a is used for climbing a mountain, which is a painful step by step. This fire is taking one step inside you, then the next step, then it grabs onto something and makes its way like a, a climber does. Ittala'a. Allati tattali'u also implies it does so over and over again. If it's, it was the past tense, ittala'at, then it would have happened in one shot. Tattali'u, it does so, then goes back, then does so again, then goes back and does so again. This, cont- this istimrar fil fi'l, right? This continuity in the act. So, the, the, and by the way, why the hearts? Because the greed, the humaza, the lumaza, the assumption that mal will last forever. Where did all of these crimes take place originally? In the heart. The heart that was overwhelmed against someone else or against their own greed, which was, wasn't even qalb, it was fu'ad. And now that the heart is being burned, it's literally inflamed. So, we don't use qalb, we use fu'ad here. Because Fu'ad implies a heart that is engulfed in flames. Lahmun Fa'id means a, pl- a f- piece of flesh that is surrounded by fire. That's what it literally means. And now it's not even Fu'ad figuratively, which it is. It's also Fu'ad literally. So, Allati tattali'u ala al-af'idah. Fa'lam annahu tala'a al-jabal wa tala'a alayhi. That you can climb a mountain with ease or with difficulty. Ida alahu when someone goes all the way over it. Thumma fi tafsir al-ayah wijhan. Then we, when we study the tafsir of this ayah, we found two things. الأول النار تدخل في أجوافهم that the fire will enter into their limbs حتى تصل إلى صدورهم until it enters and reaches their chests وهم تطلع على أفئدتهم then it will make its way above their hearts ولا شيء في بدن الإنسان ألطف من الفؤاد and there is nothing in the body of the human being that is more subtle and hidden than the fuad it is protected by a rib cage it's it's protect it's a cavity it's one of the strongest bones in the body it protects this thing by the way Allah created the human being in this way the most important faculties are the most protected right the the uh, the heart is protected and the mind is protected with the strongest bones in the, bar, in the by the body. But you know, the lips aren't protected, right? Because they can get you in trouble. They don't, they, don't need, they don't need protection. They actually need punishment sometimes, <laughs> right? So that which leads you into more sin, right? And the, the, the places of iman, the things that will save you, are protected. But the places that land you into trouble are left open. <laughs> Subhanallah. But anyway, one of the meanings of fu'ad is the innermost heart. That should also be noted. Linguistically, the innermost, the core of the heart. وَلَا أَشَدُّ تَأَلُّمًا مِنْهُ بِأَذَنْ يُمَاسُهُ Then this is, not, this is the place that causes the most or feels the most pain. فَكَيْفَ إِذَا طَلَعَتْ نَارُ جَهَنَّمْ وَاسْتَوَتْ عَلَيْهِ وَاسْتَوْلَتْ عَلَيْهِ How can it be that the fire of hell will come and make its way above him? Uh, he says, If the fire actually consumed the heart, he would die. That's why Allah Azza wa says it climbs on it, but it doesn't consume it. Meaning it crushes the bones, it crushes the flesh, but it doesn't crush the heart. The heart feels the pain, it retreats, it makes it feel the pain again, it retreats, it doesn't consume the heart, subhanAllah. فَلِذَٰلِكَ يَقُولْ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَىٰ ثُمَّ لَا يَمُوتُ فِيهَا وَلَا يَحْيَىٰ That's why he won't die in it, and he won't live, because the, if the heart is gone, the life is gone. So it will keep going back and forth against the heart. One more important comment about this ayah: وَيَجُوز أَنْ يَخَصْ أَنْ يُخَصْ الْأَفْئِدَةَ لِأَنَّهَا مَوَاطِنُ الْكُفْرِ And it's possible that Allah highlighted afida, the fuad, because those are the stations of disbelief. وَالْعَقَائِدِ الْفَاسِدَةَ and of corrupt beliefs. وَالْنِيَاتِ الْخَبِيثَةَ and of filthy intentions. نَارْ إِنَّهَا عَلَيْهِمْ مُؤْصَدَ now let's look at the word innaha alayhim, simple language. It is especially upon them. The alayhim is earlier. The normal sentence structure is innaha mu'sadatun alayhim. But alayhim is placed earlier. This is called taqdeem. Right? Taqdeem al jar wa majroor. Right? So it's brought earlier. What that implies is these are especially the people who will get in addition this mu'sada that will be cast upon them. These, this is a special punishment for these people. So it's not for everyone in hellfire, it's for these people in particular. Now, awsada is used, uh, or isad is used for a barn where animals are locked or secured. You know how you have a high enough wall that the animal can't climb out? That is, that is actually a musad. 
And to put something, also it means to put something upside down. Like you have, you know, uh, food, and you put a plate over it, a lid over it, so none of the heat escapes, for example, in a pot, etc. This is also called isad, to, to cover or to lid something. كُلَّمَا and This is why Allah says, كُلَّمَا أَرَادُوا أَنْ يَخْرُجُوا مِنْهَا أُعِيدُوا فِيهَا Every time they try to get out of it, they are placed back in it because it's littered on top. It will be littered over them, مُؤْصَدَ وَلَمْ يَقُلْ مُطْبَقَ And another word for placing a lid on top is مُطْبَقَ But he didn't use that, he used مُؤْصَدَ instead. لِأَنَّ الْمُؤْصَدَ هِيَ الْأَبْوَابَ الْمُغْلَقَ This is amazing. Because مُؤْصَدَ implies that which has doors that are closed. So it's closed, but there are actually doors there too. There are doors. So why? But if you say مُطْبَقَ there are no doors. It's just a lid with no openings. But مُؤْصَدَ has a closing, but it has doors in it, which leaves a possibility for what? Of escape, right? So let's see why. أَنَّهُ لَوْ شَاءَ يَجْعَلْ ذَلِكَ الْمَوْضَعْ بِحَيْثُ لَا يَكُونْ لَهُ الْبَابِ لَكِنَّهُ بِالْبَابِ He could have mentioned something that doesn't have doors, but he mentioned a word that does have doors. يَذْكُرُهُمُ الْخُرُوجِ Mentioning a way of escape for them, فَيَزِيدُ فِي حَسْرَتِهِمْ Because it's so high up above them, and we'll learn that in the next ayah, they keep looking at the doors and it increases in their hasra, in their, in their regret. You know, if there's, just, if there's no hope, you give up hope. But you see the door. And the false hope adds to the pain. The, hope add, the false hope adds to the pain. So Allah adds to the psychological torment by mentioning mu'sada. وَلَمْ يَقُلْ مُؤْسَدَةٌ عَلَيْهِمْ And he didn't mention مُؤْسَدَةٌ عَلَيْهِمْ He said عَلَيْهِمْ مُؤْسَدَةٌ يُفِيدُ أَنَّ الْمَقْسُودِ أَوَّلًا كَوْنُهُمْ بِهَذِهِ الْحَالَةِ And the, one of the benefits of that is to say, to make sure they understand that they will be in that state. Instead of highlighting the mu'sada, he highlighted their state first. Finally, the last ayah, فِي عَمَدٍ مُمَدَّدَةٌ Amad is translated as columns. The word mad in Arabic is to stretch. Maddada, tamdid, this is bab al From it you get the ism maf'ul, mumaddad. And this is the mumaddada, it's feminine because it's the adjective of a broken plural, jama' taksir. You know, amud is the singular and then amad. So, amadin mumaddada, right? Outstretched columns. Madda, to stretch. Maddada, to stretch to far extremes. To stretch as far as the stretching can go. Al-amud kulla mustatilin min khashab aw hadid. Amud is used for any beam, any, any column that is made with wood or, or iron. Wa huwa aslun lil bina. Uh, and it is, it is the essence of a construction, meaning the whole thing stands upon it. Amud al-bayt, as the Arab would say, yuqal amud al-bayt, they will say the beam of the house, lilladhi yaqumu bihi al-bayt, that which the whole house stands on, meaning if this collapses, the whole thing collapses. Wa fi bima'na alba ay innaha alayhim mu'sada bi amadim muddat alayha. The fi in the beginning of the ayah is in the meaning of ba also. Not only are they in it, they are being contained in it by means of these beams. Meaning these beams are made of metal, but they are in this intense heat, so there's burning metal. Now, if they were just regular beams, you could try to what? You could try to climb. But they are these, first of all, they're extremely long, and on top of that, they're in extreme heat. So you, you, just trying to touch them would even add to your pain. So tying the, now finally tying the beginning of this surah to its ending and we conclude inshallah. The, the surah began with one word for destruction, that was wail. That was the beginning of the surah. And the surah concludes fully explaining what this wail is. What, what is this? What, how bad can it get? And Allah Azza wa mentions this prison scenario where people are being thrown and they look up and there are these high columns and way on the ceiling what do they see? They see doors, but they can never reach those doors because these columns don't, they're not a means of comfort. They're, they can't even lean on them, right? They're a means of adding to their pain. May Allah Azza wa protect us from this wrath. And then, of course, finally, in the beginning of the surah, Allah Azza wa did use the word kul, which means no one should feel exempt from this crime, that we should be afraid of this crime. So I say, you know, I said this in the beginning, I'm saying this at the end. This is, uh, this is the final warning in the Quran. And, you know, and I say final in the sense that it's the last place in the Qur'an, but also it has a lot of climactic finality in it, as we just heard. May Allah Azza wa instill the fear of the hellfire in our hearts and protect us from even having to see the, 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 the cursed place of the hellfire. May Allah Azza wa protect us and our families from the fire. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa